An uplifter is a compelling leader who tries to breathe life and hope into people around them. Who listen and care and guide and help. Whose way of being in the world inspires. Who uplifts with humor and understanding. Who leads by example. Don't judge. Vulnerable. Bold determination. Who are here to create a better world. Who can learn and teach. Who encourages you. Who shines their light to lead other people. Who uses their best self in order to help others. I found the life that I liked and I worked toward that. We are all uplifters. Mwah, big love. Welcome to the Uplifters Podcast. I'm your host, Aranza Savas, and I love every episode of this show and sort of fall in love with every one of the women that we talk to who so courageously shares her story and her perspective. But today is especially special, and in all honesty, it's the one in some ways that I've been the most nervous to record and to share because today we are welcoming Lisa Halberstadt onto our show. And Lisa does some pretty heroic work. She is a senior investigative reporter for The Voice of San Diego, which is a nonprofit investigative outlet in San Diego where she writes about her community's homelessness substance abuse, and behavioral health crises, and the people who are impacted by them. She's written about a lot of other really important subjects as well. But I met Lisa a couple months ago when my brother-in-law, Greg, died from the effects of substance abuse, disease, and homelessness. And while we lost him on that day, we had missed him terribly for over a decade, because the drugs had gotten in between him and us, as they do. Addiction creates distance. And it was a distance that despite our best efforts, we couldn't bridge. And so we missed a lot of Greg's life. And when he died, it left us all feeling hungry for any piece of him that we could hold on to that would let us know him in these last years, that would let us back into his life. My children felt really frustrated and angry that they hadn't gotten to know their uncle. And my resourceful daughter went on her own search for understanding for the uncle that she had missed. And in doing so, stumbled across an article written not long before Greg's passing about his life. Lisa's work, Lisa's writing gave us a sense of peace and understanding about something that we had really struggled to understand, and that frankly, we had no other way of understanding. But that's what Lisa's work does. It creates understanding, and it bridges gaps. Through her work, she helps people understand what it is to be homeless the effects on individuals and families and communities. Her work has created policy changes that support these populations, and she's helped illuminate the truth of an experience by rehumanizing what it is to be someone who struggles day after day just to stay alive. But as humans, our own quest to live and to keep going, it's really easy to create a distance between ourselves and those that are othered, those that feel different from us. And it's not out of any bad intention, but naturally we as humans can sit in our homes and feel like somehow we are different than people who don't have them. But the truth is we're just humans with the same goals and the same needs, and the same hopes, and the same dreams. And talking to Lisa has helped me better understand that. And so I wanted to introduce her to you. 
because I believe that her work has the power to bring us back together by using story and journalism. She helps us see a little more clearly. And I can think of nothing more uplifting than that. So please join me in welcoming Lisa Halverstadt to the Uplifters podcast. Thank you so much for having me. And that was just a beautiful introduction. I'm so flattered by that. I'm so grateful. And true to form, I know you were up all night last night working. (laughs) So special thanks for joining us today. Maybe we just start by talking about your last 24 hours to better understand what it is you do and what goes into it. Yes. So I have been in beast mode, I would say, the last week or so because the city of San Diego has been considering an encampment ban, which would impact folks who camp on the street. I won't get into all the nuances of that, but I've been writing a lot about various angles of this. And uh, last night, a Tuesday night, city council voted on this ordinance and voted to approve it. There were more than four hours of public comments. Actually, one of the neat moments last night was that I had written about a, a guy who struggled to get shelter. He actually went to this place called the Homelessness Response Center to try to get shelter. And on the 11th day, he finally got it. And he was invited to come and speak to the city council about that after I, I highlighted his story. But ultimately... There were lots of deliberations. It was a pretty tense meeting. I was in touch with my editor throughout the night and ended up working probably, I guess I was done maybe around 1130 or something last night and things were still hitting my inbox after that. So it was a long night, but it's important. You know, journalists really take this role seriously to tell you what's happening, including when it happens (laughs) at convenient times but also just to provide context throughout and be prepared, you know, to cover every angle of something like this that's very complex. What drew you to journalism in general, Lisa? Well, I think it found me before I found it. I had teachers that recognized this in me before I saw it. I was always really curious. I would pick different topics that I was interested in. I loved to go to the library and I would just read a stack of books. I mean, everything from the John F. Kennedy assassination to dermatology. So quite a range. (laughs) And I also love to write. And I love to talk to people about what I learned. And so it just was very natural. So I had some teachers who said, you should work for the student paper, Lisa, you know, (laughs) because uh, it just seemed really obvious to them, I think. So like I said, it it found me. Mm. And then what drew you to this type of journalism and this particular focus? So years ago, from a practical standpoint, my news outlet was looking at beads and uh, we were just watching as the homelessness crisis was getting worse in San Diego, as it has been in a lot of other communities as well. And We just thought, you know, there are a lot of stories that are talking about like this, you know, nonprofit has a new shelter they're opening up or here's this new initiative. But there wasn't a lot of accountability reporting that looked at like, what are we doing collectively? Who's in charge here? And who's, you know, are are we making a dent in this? Because it doesn't really look like we're making a significant dent in this. So what's going on? From a practical standpoint, that's how I got into it. But looking back, I mean, there are certain things that make it such a good fit and make me more passionate about this. You know, I really identify with people that are underestimated and who don't feel like they have a voice. In some ways, I grew up feeling that way. I have ADHD, which not a huge deal, right, in this day and age. But at the time that I was diagnosed, less was known about this. And so, you know, I had a had a doctor that kind of made my parents a little scared about what might be my prospects for future success. And You know, at one point I had a teacher that told my parents that I was an idiot and I found out about it. That was difficult. But in that moment, I still remember being a third grader with, you know, crazy hair and my big Coke bottle glasses just saying, no one is ever going to call me an idiot again. I think back about that sometimes because I, you know, obviously I'm an objective journalist. You know, I go hard (laughs) after everything and everyone to get answers. But I do understand what it means to be underestimated. And so there's a certain understanding in that, that maybe somebody doesn't look like they have that much to offer, you know, to the outside world. But in fact, they do have a lot to offer. 
And also kind of from a just a sort of silly thing that I, I never thought about is I do not have a sense of smell. I was born without one as far as I know. And this has actually been a superpower for me on the street because I'm able to sit with people and I don't smell them, I see them. And it has turned out to be something that I hated (laughs) for so many years that actually makes me better at my job. So what do you see that close up, Lisa? Oh boy, a lot. (laughs) I do see a lot of effort to create community and support that a lot of people don't see. I see a lot of caregivers, people caring for other people on the street, whether that's in the form of literally changing their diapers, I'm not exaggerating, or, you know, helping to watch someone's stuff while they go to that important appointment, or the word that gets spread on the street, or, you know, also how the community, especially with this fentanyl crisis we're in, that are literally saving each other's lives in a lot of cases and and bearing witness to a lot of really scary stuff. But it's also just really hard out there. And I think often it's it's easy for those of us that have a place that every day we can go and we can leave our stuff when we go to work. We can have a routine because we have a place we can count on, you know, easily getting a shower or to use the restroom or to get a get a meal. This isn't something that people who live on the street can necessarily count on. They, you know, maybe having to be concerned about moving to different areas, whether that's because of police enforcement or, you know, maybe there's someone on the street that's threatening them and they need to move to another place. Or, you know, sometimes I hear about, oh, you know, there was a, you know, a group that came down and brought food today and then another group and another group. But then for the next two days, there wasn't anyone coming. So what do we do during that time? And People really struggle with restroom and shower access. I know a lot of people who stay in areas specifically because there is some restroom or shower access. And just imagine, you know, often people will say, get a job. You know, everybody wants to take a shower before they go to their job. Imagine if you had to get in line early enough that you can get your shower to then go to work and the line might be snaking around a particular area. And the showers aren't necessarily, you know, sometimes people relying even on, you know, vans that drive around that have showers in them, essentially. And and those might not be available every day. Sometimes it's only one or two days a week that the, the shower van pulls up. So there are just a lot of challenges that I think can be really hard for people that just are able to come home every day to really understand. What do you see as the effects of these basic human needs being unmet for these people? I mean, it's very traumatic. People do feel just completely downtrodden. And one thing I wanted to make sure to say today too is that, you know, so often people look past homeless people. They look away from them. And homeless people feel that. They feel it. One of my uplifters in my life, Peggy Peaty, uh, is an excellent photojournalist who I've had the opportunity to work with the last year or so. And she has a blog called Tales of the Street. And she interviewed this guy uh, named Moses recently. And he talked about how when he lived on the street, he would often feel like, okay, you know, I can't take this anymore. Maybe it's time to end this. And people would walk past, you know, and he would feel that judgment. But every once in a while when he felt like that, Someone would look at him, acknowledge, smile at him, and it would turn it around. He would keep going. And I think it's so important to reflect on that, how much when people are, you know, sort of rejected, whether, you know, that's overt or not, that we as humans feel that. And that actually is part of the hierarchy of needs is is feeling that connection. And so, you know, I think many of us think that we can't do anything about homelessness. It's just this horrible, systemic, intractable issue. What I often tell people is you can smile at someone and say hi, and it might have more of an impact than you think. I've done it. I've walked past people. I've averted my eyes. I have 
it's, <laughs> we act as though it's catching. <laughs> and there is a lot of violence. And I live in New York City where we've had an increase in violence committed by unhoused people, or at least a lot more reporting on it, <laughs> depending on who you talk to about whether, about which numbers to look at. And so now I do feel a greater sense of fear than I used to about looking people in the eye because it, I worry for myself and my children that it will be a provocation. But I also think that we have an intuition that can guide us about what is a dangerous situation and what is not. We know when somebody is volatile and somebody's on the edge. And we know when somebody's just living their life and might benefit from a kind eye or it's not even a kind eye because that sounds, it sounds like some sort of saviorism, but it's really just acknowledging that we are human beings in the same way that I would pass the lady with the stroller and the fancy shoes. And sometimes it's as quick as just a nod to just acknowledge hey, I see you, just like if you were walking past your neighbor on the street. And I think, you know, to your point too, I mean, I do have to use my gut a lot of times. There are some people that are not ready to talk to me today. And so, you know, I may not engage with them, but there are a lot of people, I think just people would be so surprised how much a lot of unhoused people want connection. By saying that, I think you help bridge that gap between us and them. It's the simplest thing. And I also hear in your story how hard these people are working. Because I think part of the way that we create distance is a sense of a perception of laziness or resignation and surrender. And when I listen to you, I hear you say, well, of course they feel resigned. And of course there is some surrendering because... Every single human need has to be fought for so hard. How exhausting that must be. What has surprised you most in getting to know people who are unhoused and in many cases addicted? How many people are just good people, just like the rest of us. You know, in any group of people, there are nice people and there are not so nice people. That's in any group. I just encounter a lot of people that are so kind and especially when they find out what I do and that I want to tell their stories, they are lining up other people to talk to me. They want to help. Oh, let me tell you about this thing. Or, you know, sometimes even when I will show up somewhere and people tell can tell that I'm a reporter, they'll try to come be closer to me to talk to me when the other person's done or say, hey, I've got a story. I've got a story. So you know, I think like many people before I wrote about this topic, I had a lot of preconceived notions about the homeless population. And I had a sense that people were gruff and mean and, and you know, maybe scary. But what I found is most people are, you know, pretty good people. They have their flaws like any of us. But a lot of good people are out there struggling. What do you believe needs to be done to make things better? for these people? That's a big question. I know. That is a big question. You know, as a journalist, I can't really have opinions about what the best solutions are other than to report on what data tells us. I think, you know, one thing that is obvious is the word homeless. It indicates that they don't have a home. And so housing that is affordable and that people can efficiently get into or that you know, when somebody is falling, when somebody's struggling, that we have a system that can, you know, kind of hurry up and, and put its arms out and support them is really crucial to solving this problem. You need a homeless service system that is both able to prevent people from falling into homelessness, and then when they do, able to efficiently help them get out of homelessness. And that's a struggle in communities across the country, including San Diego right now, because so many more people are falling into homelessness, they're moving into shelters, and then there's not housing available at the end. Um, and so people sort of get stuck. I also just think in general that, you know, again, I can't have beliefs about solutions or other things, but one thing that I just refuse to ever lose sight of is that we are talking about people. We are not talking about pests. You know, we're talking about 
fellow community members. And I think it's really important to keep that in mind when we think about solutions. And And the thing about community members is that a community can have a lot of different types of people in it with different opinions and experiences, but they're still our community members. And community members in many cases who are sick, who are struggling with disease as a result of homelessness or addiction or mental illness that led to the homelessness. A lot of people actually have more mental health and substance abuse challenges once they end up on the street. So I have met so many people who started using on the street. I'll give an example. Um, Julie, a woman that I've been keeping in close touch with, she was a meth user uh, and an alcoholic. And she is now hopefully moving into housing pretty soon here. She's come a really long way. But she, like many homeless women, shared with me that she started using meth to stay awake at night because she was scared of being assaulted. And so this was sort of a coping mechanism for a tough situation that she was in as a vulnerable woman on the street. A lot of people get PTSD living on the street. Just imagine all that uncertainty and sounds and just constantly being worried that somebody's going to attack you or something's going to happen to you. People get deeply depressed on the street. People, you know, may have some a mental health issue that's v- relatively minor, like many of us might deal with anxiety or something, but that gets exacerbated on the street because just the daily trauma of it is just so much more than what most of us who are housed experience. And the level of support. So if I have an anxious day, I can go into my cozy bed and take a nap or walk into my nice warm shower and take a shower or (laughs) go to my doctor and receive care using my powerful insurance. And I think what you're pointing to is that these people don't have access to these available fixes. And so they turn to the fix that's available. And so often it just, it hits me because I'll talk to somebody and they'll say, you're the first person that talked to me today. Thank you for listening. I have people that the first time we meet, they're, they're hugging me because no one's seen them that day. No one's seen them maybe even that week. Yeah. And if those of us who have access to warm beds and hot showers feel like we are desperate to be seen and known and understood how intense that must feel when even your most basic needs are not regularly being met. You see so much hardship every day. How do you take care of yourself to sustain this work that you do? So for years, I've you know had different self-care tactics, listening to music as one, talking to my friends, But I'll be honest that there was a time earlier this year, I realized I was kind of at a turning point where, you know, if you want to think about life as a cup of water, but that water is trauma. The goal for me is always to keep, because I'm talking to so many people that are in the trauma cycle, I'm seeing a lot of things, is to just keep that cup from overflowing, keep it manageable. And I usually have been able to do that, but I, I worked on a really tough story that really hit me hard personally. And that led me to start going to therapy weekly. I'm in a program for journalists with the DART Center, great resource for folks to check out. And that has been so uplifting for me. And really what that's about is I wasn't deeply depressed or anything, but just to have a space to put my own feelings about the things I was seeing. Because what I realized is as much as I had great friends and family that wanted to support me, and of course my editors who were supportive, I was constantly just taking in other people's emotions and traumas. And I just needed to create a specific space where I could kind of talk about how I felt about something so that I could just run back out there. And I think, you know, I debated if you asked this, if I was going to say this, but I think it's important that we need to create space to talk about how we feel about things. And that helps make us better for other people. Agree. It's essential. And 
we have to normalize healing the healers and caring for the caregivers. And so much more can happen when our cups are not empty. It is enabling and sustaining. Thank you so much for sharing that. My dog is very excited in the background. It means a lot to him, apparently, to get attention, (laughs) to feel seen and heard in this moment. A lot of unsheltered people have dogs. Had a lot of dogs over the years. Some very cute ones. (laughs) Yeah, that is, it's always interesting to me to see the love between dog owners and dogs on the street um, and to imagine the roles that those dogs play that of, I assume, protector and confidant and comfort. Absolutely. I think a lot of times people will judge, why does this person have a dog or why does this person stay in a tent? And there's often a complex answer to that question that can be really hard for those of us who are housed to contemplate. Maybe going into a shelter means not having that dog, which is your best friend, in the entire world and your reason for being. Or maybe, you know, there are folks out on the street that I've met who have caregivers out on the street. And, you know, those caregivers, maybe it's a a boyfriend and a girlfriend. And if they were to go into a shelter, they couldn't share the same bed when someone literally has cancer or epilepsy and needs that sort of around the clock monitoring and, and support. Or maybe, you know, they've had challenges in shelters before. Maybe their person has PTSD. And so the idea of being in a shelter that is just packed with people is just terrifying. And I think a lot of us who are housed might acknowledge to ourselves, like, I actually would not like to go stay in a shelter. I am a light sleeper. And if I stayed in a shelter, I would never sleep because somebody would always be snoring. You know, somebody's always getting up and moving in the middle of the night. So I think it's important to think about there's often context, just like our housed friends' lives. You don't understand why did somebody take that job or, oh my God, why is she dating that person? But there's a story from their perspective as to why they're doing this. And that's something too, even on, you know, totally separate from homelessness-related reporting and my investigative reporting, I'm constantly thinking about why is this person doing what they're doing? There is a reason that they're doing this. And often that reason is, you know, and kind of that process is a way to understand. And sometimes it's a way to understand why something unsavory is happening, but it can be really insightful to take a step back and put ourselves in that other person's shoes and realize maybe this is, I'm not seeing every aspect of this. And as humans, we think we do. We think we know more than we ever could. And we make leaps and generalizations for all sorts of reasons for our own psychological safety. And if I were to take only one thing for this important and really truly insightful and inspiring conversation, it would be to just give ourselves the gift of seeing our communities more fully. I love that. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for what you've done for our family. For those of you listening, please head over to the upliftherspodcast.com. I will share links to the organizations and pages that Lisa mentioned, and we'll hopefully be able to source from her some other recommendations for ways that we can keep learning and growing and rising together. Thank you for listening to the Uplifters podcast. If you're getting a boost from these episodes, please share them with the Uplifters in your life and then join us in conversation over at theupliftherspodcast.com. Head over to Spotify, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast and like, follow, and rate our show. It'll really help us connect with more uplifters and it'll ensure you never miss one of these beautiful stories. Mwah! Big love. Painted water sunshine with rosemary and tongue. Dwell in the perplexing, though you find it vexing. Toss a star and hover, be your own best lover. Relish in a new prime. Planet
Plant a tree in springtime Dance without all hindsight Bring the sun to twilight Lift you up Whoa Lift you up Whoa Lift you up Whoa Lift you up Lift you up Whoa Mommy, stop crying. Mommy, stop crying. You're disturbing the peace.